that. Through observing changes in the meaning of certain terms, as for example, the term dasa. As described in the Rig Veda, and this is again the earliest text, the dasa was in effect the other of the Arya. Inevitably, what constitutes otherness, the nature of being alien, is based on a reflection of oneself. If in nothing else, then at least in the characteristics that we choose to represent the other. Neither the Arya nor the Dasa societies were homogenous, unified, and monolithic. Societies and communities never are. Some Dasa chiefs were arch enemies of the Aryas, but a few seem to have actually been patrons of the Brahmins. But relations with the Dasas change by the time of the later Vedic compositions, two to three centuries later. Here, they are regarded with contempt, unless proved otherwise, as in the case of the Dasya Putra Brahmins. They emerge as part of the Shudra Varn, the Dasas, and labor for the Aryas. The status of the Dasa had gradually been lowered, although the ritual specialists among them may have got a foothold into Brahmanical ritual. The process by which this change occurred needs to be investigated in greater detail. How did a group of clans, the Dasas, ultimately become a group of bondsmen and assigned the lowest Varna status? It would also point to a change in the meaning of the term Dasa, shifting from referring to the other to meaning the subordinate one. This is a very good lesson for historians because we always tend to translate words in identical manner from early texts to later texts, and we have to always remind ourselves that word, each word has its own history and changes, and therefore we have to continually correlate words to contexts. The understanding of these kinds of changes in terms of the interaction between the varying societies that existed in the Northwestern subcontinent at that time is far more helpful to explaining that period of history than the endless concern that now goes on with who was indigenous and who was foreign. The debate on the latter pays little attention to ascertaining whether the consciousness of being indigenous or foreign had any meaning for those societies of those times. Recognized boundaries were non-existent. Therefore, the differences between us and them were based on other features, such as language, cultural patterns, and belief systems, and also on neg negotiating hierarchies of status. Kosambi had suggested that plow agriculture, iron technology, and the use of the horse for mobility, together with the dependence on cattle for food, were among the crucial factors that gave the Aryan speakers, the speakers of Indo-Aryan, an edge over other societies. This was an attempt to explain why the speakers of Indo-Aryan became, in fact, the dom dominant group in, by the middle of the first millennium BC. This is what allowed them to become the dominant culture. But let's see what the present-day evidence is on these factors. Plow agriculture, he argued, weakened clan solidarity and allowed caste to become the agency of control over land. But the archaeological evidence for plow agriculture from more recent excavations goes back to pre-Harappan times, and therefore prior to the presence of Indo-Aryan speakers. If the Arya-Dasa relationship was between those who were primarily pastoralists, and those who were agriculturalists, as seems likely, then a different set of indices would also have to be analyzed. 
The introduction of iron technology, which was dated to the late second and the early first millennium BC, is said to have facilitated the clearing, the cutting down of forests, which allowed the extension of cultivated areas. Subsequently, the surplus from agriculture led to the establishing of urban centers. <clears throat> but iron technology in itself is not a sufficient factor of change. The archaeological presence of iron varies from region to region, and in the peninsula, for example, dates to the second millennium BC. Here again, it is prior to the presence of the Indo-Aryan speakers. The important question is not just the introduction of iron technology, but the way in which it might have been appropriated and used by speakers of Indo-Aryan to establish their authority. The locations of sources and the treatment of the metal, such as forging or smelting, and the function of artifacts would be helpful in understanding the nature of the change brought by this technology. Similarly, the production of a surplus from agriculture in itself is not sufficient to bring about change. Surplus is a process and has to be directed towards change, as is done by those who use it as a resource. The crucial question in Kosambi's argument is, who controls the technology? Even if the evidence has altered the picture somewhat, the questions posed by Kosambi are still relevant and require answers. The interaction between tribe and caste is an essential feature of historical change. But this was not the only social mutation in history. Parallel to this was the development of exchange relations from barter to commerce, to which, again, Kosambi drew attention. He brought into his study not only the geographical expansion of commerce, but also its links with Buddhist monasteries, particularly in the Deccan. This became another perspective on the mutation of tribes into complex polities. Where monasteries were linked to trade, they signaled not only the presence of commerce, but also craft production and towns to support that commerce, which is a different economy and society from what preceded it. Barter is more often associated with clan-based societies and can be transformed into commerce with the coming of the state and with extensive trading links. An obvious index of commerce as different from barter, a major distinction between barter is exchange and commerce, is the presence of coins as a common unit of value. The presence of coins marks a departure. Kosambi's work on numismatics was closely related to his professional training as a mathematician. He used the logic of mathematics to formulate his questions and statistical methods to examine the data. This was new in the study of coins. The earliest coins in circulation in the subcontinent were what have been called punch-marked coins. These were small, roughly square or rectangular shaped pieces of silver or copper that had a cluster of symbols on one side and small marks on the reverse side. The coins coincided with the evolution of early historical urban centers in the Ganges Plain and the Northwest. They were in circulation during the second half of the first millennium BC, that is from about the sixth century BC onwards. The challenge that they posed was that unlike later coins, they were neither dated nor did most of them carry an indication of the issuing authority. And if you look at a coin today, these are very obvious things, the date of the coin, the amount, the unit, the value of the coin, and who issued it. Therefore, the basic questions were, what did the symbols represent? Who made the small reverse marks? 
And was there a way of separating the older coins from the later, younger coins? Observing that the coins, mainly of silver, were cut with accuracy and that some came from hoards, Kusambi decided to use one such hoard as his basic data. A hoard would provide more reliable statistical data than stray finds. And this is where his knowledge of statistics was crucial. There was the further advantage that the terminal date of the hoard was known from the presence in the hoard of a few datable post-Mauryan Indo-Greek coins. Of the punch-marked coins, some would have been in circulation for a longer period than others, with a greater amount of wear and tear. This is common sense. The more you use the coin, the more it wears down. Kosambi argued that there was, therefore, an age-weight correlation. Um, the older the coin, the more worn out, well, worn out it would be, the lighter it would be in weight. The more recent the coin, the less worn out it would be, the heavier it would be in, in weight. Therefore, by measuring the weight with exactitude, he would be able to provide a chronological flow from earlier to later coins. This he did meticulously and with an absolutely amazing amount of patience. It's not the kind of thing that all of us rush to do in a hurry. He then went on to study the distribution of the symbols and to interpret what they represented. The commonly used crescent on top of arches was read by him as a Mauryan symbol, suggesting the name Chandra Gupta, the moon hidden in the hills. His readings, however, for dynasties and kings are debatable, despite the logic of his reasoning. But the idea of using a statistical method in the study of coins is certainly worth pursuing. The other feature was that of these little small reverse marks. It had been thought that the coins were issued not by kings, but by traders. Some of the coins are in fact inscribed, a very few are inscribed with this legend that reads Negama from Nigama, perhaps referring to a guild. And Kosambi maintained that the reverse marks, these little nicks at the back of the coin, were made by traders who from time to time checked the weight and the value of the coin and marked it. Some of the marking could also have been that of the state superintendent, such as the Lakshana Adhyaksha, or the examiner of coins whose functions are described in the Kautilya Arthashastra. In the course of examining the coins, he discovered that some were debased, had a lower silver content and a larger copper lead content. Using the chronology of age weight statistics, he maintained that the debasement dated to the late Mauryan period. Correlating this with references to double, crossing, uh, double cropping in the Kautilya Arthashastra and to state supervised agriculture, he maintained that the decline of the Mauryan empire was due to a fiscal crisis and a pressure on Mauryan currency and by extension on the economy. The pressure came from the immense expenditure on the army and the administrative infrastructure, which we again know from the Kautilya Arthashastra, and the expansion of trading activity involving more and more transactions in silver coinage. Not all these arguments have been accepted, but his focus on a crisis affecting imperial power can provide new dimensions to investigating the nature of empire. For us historians, it was a much needed departure to be able to discuss more realistic causes of the decline of kingdoms instead of restricting and uh, re re reacting all the time to the discussion with the predictable and inevitable single cause of what was called foreign invasions. 
A new dimension to the study of state systems was thereby opened up. By way of an aside, one could ask why Kosambi, who used his knowledge of mathematics to great effect in the study of numismatics, did not combine his expertise in mathematics and history to write a history of mathematics in early India, a subject which is sadly, by and large, lacking. There have been some good early histories, but nothing recent. If there was anyone in India who might have initiated a Joseph Needham-like project on science and civilization in India, it could have been Kosambi. Was it his commitment to writing a Marxist history of India, founded on studies of the society and the economy, that kept him from a history of mathematics? Even commentaries on the major mathematical texts would have been illuminating. But he seems to have preferred editing works of literature. But even these have now become standard works. At the time when Kosambi was writing, the data on trade was more limited than it is now. Trade routes that ran from the northwest with a hub at Taxila were known from the Greek and Latin sources of the Hellenistic kingdoms in West Asia and the Roman Empire and were known through archaeological data, to some extent. Some routes went westwards to the eastern Mediterranean overland. Some went overland southeastwards to the Ganges Delta. And some crossed the Vindhyas into the peninsula. These provided links between the cities of northern India and the peninsula from Maurya to Gupta times. That there was a vigorous trade was well established, and there was much coming and going between people from numerous places. This was exemplified in the emergence of styles of architecture and sculpture, and by reference to what were probably dialogues on matters pertaining to astronomy, mathematics, and medicine, all of which constituted the knowledge systems of that time. The religions of the traders, interestingly, at this point, begin to start speaking of a savior figure. St. John of the Revelations among the Christians, Shaushant among the Zoroastrians, the Buddha Maitreya, and the coming of Vishnu as Kalkin. It all happens at about the same time in this area from the eastern Mediterranean to northern India. This was a remarkable conjunction of ideas. Trade with the eastern Mediterranean, as treated in earlier studies, was regarded primarily as land-based, and relatively less attention had been given to maritime trade. The last few decades have seen extensive evidence on maritime trade and consequently new kinds of studies, some of which are being carried out in your very own National Institute of Oceanography, uh, which I was interested to um, get to know about this morning. Merchants from Alexandria financed ships and cargo to travel from the Red Sea ports to the western coasts of India, stretching from Gujarat to Kerala. Using the southwest monsoon winds, these ships tacked across the Arabian Sea. The cargo they took back was substantially of pepper and spices and some textiles. The recent discovery of a trading contract in Greek relating to Mosiris, the port of Mosiris in Kerala, and of what might have been the port of Mosiris near Cochin, which is being suggested these days, further underlines the importance of this trade. It also begins to be seen as a forerunner of the later pattern of trade with Arab and Jewish merchants. In fact, there is a continuous maritime history, and the history of the west coast of India forms a subject on its own. But this early Roman trade, as it has been called, began tentatively in the first century BC, peaked over the millennium change, 
and continued to be relevant to the economy, particularly of peninsular India, until about the mid-first millennium AD. It has been suggested that the mutation of the chiefdoms of the south, the Cheras, Cholas, and Pandyas, into kingdoms, the change from chiefdom, the tribal clan society into kingdoms, another aspect of the change from tribe to caste was in part due to their participation in the economy of this exchange keeping in mind, of course, fa the fact that state systems require far larger revenues than chiefdoms and clan societies. Roman objects, other than coins and local imitations of these, turn up at excavations in the peninsula. This was a trade that touched many centers, and among these were Buddhist monasteries. As compared to 40 years ago, we now have evidence of a network of monasteries almost covering the Deccan. They come down Syriatum along the east coast with a cluster in the Krishna Delta, the epicenter being the famous Buddhist site of Amravati. In the west, as Kosambi noted, the, monast the monasteries stand like senators at the passes that lead down from the Western Ghats to the narrow coastal plains. Focal points of trading activities in the Deccan tend to coexist.